And now for today's guest coming from New York, and you're going to know he's in New York City because you are going to hear the trucks outside hunking as they go by, which is a nice thing. You know, you're going to hear a bunch of other stuff going on. So it's always nice to see that. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jeremy Rowe. Take it away, Jeremy. Thank you very much, John. Thanks to uh, Dave, Dave, Jim, and Jay for aiding and abetting on this. Let me go ahead and get my PowerPoint up here. And Okay. I'm going to talk with you about the uh, Library of Congress National Stereoscopic Association uh, agreement that's been signed recently, but I wanted to give you a little background on the NSA and, uh, and history for context. I started collecting views and actually started with stereo views on my great-grandmother's porch with a stereo viewer and a stack of cards. I've been trying to collect some of the vintage images of NSA events and NSA history, so I thought I'd sort of start with a little bit of background to share that. First is uh, Pioneer photographer and researcher William C. Darrow that wrote one of the first books on uh, stereo photography. I'm interested in collecting and in the history of stereo so and stereo collecting. So we've been able to acquire correspondence from Darrow about collecting in the 50s and 60s and a variety of different stories about him and his work. This is a shot of him here and I'm going to be toggling through with the uh, anaglyphs as a second for folks that are interested in that. So we'll do it as a a one to the full card, which I think is important to see as an artifact or an object, and then the anaglyph to follow. Here's another image of Dara uh, looking at stereo views. He wrote the uh, books on stereo, uh, early book on uh, stereo photography and stereo collecting, and the book on carte de visites in the 1960s that were sort of the Bibles at that time. He was doing a presentation in 1973 at the annual meeting of the Photographic Historical Society of New England, FISNI and uh, was talking with a variety of folks there. And that sort of was a catalyst with uh, people like Richard Rusak, John Craig, John Waldsmith, and others who started planning this collector's organization, the NSA. They put together the first stereo world. This is volume one, number one, that you can see on the side there. Uh, the views have been taken by, of uh, Dara have been taken by Nick Graver. I wanted to thank him for letting me use those views for the illustrations for this. Here's the and I'll go to version for you. I'll give you a second for that. The uh, NSA was founded uh, shortly after, uh, after the newsletter in March, April, uh, November 15th, 1974, as a 501c nonprofit. And uh, that's the beginning of our history, the uh, Stereo World publication, the conventions, and uh, collecting and creating stereo views through the NSA. Here's a early view of the NSA board at uh, Columbus, Ohio in 75. Uh, Richard Rusak, Brant Rolls, Gordy Hoffman, John Waltzmith. And in the back, you can see one of the exhibits of stereo views that they were showing in, in the back corner. On the right, there's a stereoscope on the table, kind of a nice one. And uh, again, uh, Richard Rusak's holding a stereo camera on his lap in the foreground. Here's the analog version for you. Another view of an early NSA board portrait with uh, Gordon Hoffman. Uh, this has uh, Pam and Dick Ostreicher, a variety of folks. I think that might be Len Wally, who I believe is on here holding a view up in the back, but uh, trying to identify all the folks. And John Waldsmith at the far right of the view. Here's the anaglyph for you. An example of one of the uh, exhibitions. This is a uh, early collector Alan Cotter and his wife Paulette at the first NSA exhibiting their stereo Graflex with uh, the table the kind of things that we were doing. People were collecting but really hadn't pulled together until this part of the 70s. So people were coming from around the country to get together in per Ohio in particular at this point, but uh, sharing information about stereo photography, about the cameras, about the viewers, about the images as the NSA formed. Most of the rest of these people by Brant Rolls, who was a photographer and collector and board member. Jeremy, how, how did these the people? Anaglyph. Yeah, how did these people? Uh, what did they do before you created this? The, the, the NSA was created. I mean, he's you know he he didn't start collecting at that point, right? What, what, there were people right? that collected in, in the 1950s and 60s. There've always been people that collected, but they were really um, sort of divergent. Uh, there were, were collectors that put together very significant collections, like uh, Dr. Beck, who traveled in the 40s and 50s, who was a uh, stereo collector out of uh, Eastern Washington. Uh, unfortunately, he liked to make notations in red ballpoint pen on one half of the views that he collected, but put together an astounding collection. And those were 
um, sold separate, you know, sold eventually, uh, his collection was sold off. People would advertise in things like Antiques in the Art Weekly and uh, 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 Antique Collector. A lot of the trade journals would have classified sections in the back and people would get together that way. Uh, there really weren't a lot of shows until the this era, the 1970s and, and the mid 70s when this started happening. The uh, uh, Strober Collection was one of the major auctions in New York that drew people together from the Midwest and New England and the East and got the Photo Historical Society of New England and other groups together. So uh, it was sort of ad hoc until the 70s. And then there was sort of a zeitgeist with people pulling together and starting to pay attention to each other and sharing and things like Stereo World and the other publications sort of drew that together. And was that pretty local at that point? I mean, were, were local people first? And then is that the evolution? It, it, it started locally, but word got out fairly quickly. People were, you know, sort of jungle drums about the collectors groups starting. Uh, we had 300 members in the NSA by 1975. So, you know, within a year, there were 300 members. So there was sort of this rising interest in collecting photography. People like John Craig that put out his lists. There were a lot of people that put out the uh, mimeographed lists or Xerox lists of views and equipment for sale. People started sharing those and building mailing lists. And those mailing lists were then absorbed by the NSA, which then helped create a mailing list for Stereo World, which helped get people to connect, which picked them up to help get people to join and uh, participate. People would fly in for the organizational meetings to be able to collect. Um, there were groups like the Chicago Photographic Collector Society. Uh, that uh, hosted one of the other conventions with the NSA, and uh, they had their own user group, their own base. There was the uh, Western Photographic Collectors Association on the West Coast, um, another one in the Puget Bay area in Seattle. So it seemed like the 1970s were really this rich collecting, uh, uh, flourishing of interest in collecting and making images during that time. And the NSA sort of took advantage of it, being connective tissue that wove those together and, and connected people. Yeah, those those were the days when mailing lists actually required a stamp and and, and somebody to lick an envelope. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that was. And, and if you were buying, it was also when you had your dial phone and you were calling up and you would have to call up and make uh, the auctions and the listings. You'd dial up and wait and wait and wait and finally get through and then make a make a bid and then wait, dial, 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 bid, make a you know, wait and go through the process. It was just uh, excruciating. I've got about sixty linear feet of the vintage catalogs that I've collected and. Uh, very interesting resource to look back at some of the previous dealers and the items that have showed up, how they worked their way through the collecting organizations to museums and archives and how that all worked. But uh, yeah, many, many uh, remembrances of waiting until two and three in the morning, making phone calls, trying to dial in to be the last person to get a, that item as it was uh, up for sale. Yeah, and not get killed uh, by those long distance call charges. Remember that? Anyway, oh, you know, like they, yeah, they, they were painful and uh, also trying to send people first class postage or uh, uh, priority postage back then because I was in Arizona and living vicariously through catalogs and everybody in the East Coast got them ahead of time. So I was uh, having a little bit of handicap competing for that. So as soon as the show started happening in California and other places, I was very uh, uh, early on the bandwagon, 77, 78, to um, you know, drive over to LA for the LA photographic shows and uh, trying to get back to DC for the DC photo shows and others as they worked their way through. Just one last question before we proceed. Sure. How old were you? How, how old were you then? What was your age? I, I was in grad school, so uh, wow. uh, 2021, what a great trying interest. to uh, make it work. And actually, uh, Pam and Dick Ostreicher came to the university I was working at as uh, visiting professors. And uh, they'd come from the East Coast with an unbelievable collection of material. And I'd been picking you know, local things, and they just blew me out of the water. And uh, the quality of the things that they had and the history and the connections with the East Coast. So I went to California to the first WPCA show with them. And uh, after that, it was all over. I was um trying to hit every show every collector every uh, mailing list i get my hands on <laughs> it was wow. fun and a great community of people that's um how i met most of my friends on the east coast and now uh, paul wing this is interesting this is uh paul wing he was a stereo viewer collector he's put together one of the uh, definitive books on stereo viewers this is a shot of him in 1976 by nick graver at one of the uh, nsa conventions showing his pedestal viewer collection he collected every variant and did just some amazing tome of uh, floor mount viewers, tabletop viewers, handheld viewers. It's uh, really okay. well worth looking at if you're interested. Flip to the anaglyph. Yeah, there we go. So we, people get a good look at that table. Sure. How, I, just just briefly, how how uh, what was his background? Well, how did he get into this? What was his background I, in, in engineering? I don't have that off the top of my head. Most of the folks were either engineers or had some sort of uh, uh, connection with photography. Very few were antiquarians or antique dealers. Most of them had some other 
connection. There were a lot of people that were involved in uh, postal, uh, postal postmen and postal collectors, people that came from the uh, postal uh, industry, post, uh, postmen and others. There were uh, many academics that came into this. Uh, there were a number of people on the stereo card size that came in from an academic research side using the views as resource materials for their publication as primary source documents as they were doing research for uh, publication. And uh, so it's, it's a pretty broad range. I'm sorry, yeah, I don't know if Paul's off no, the top. It's, it's beautiful. What a diverse group, man. It's amazing. Yeah, it still is. I mean, you look at the background of the people that are involved in, uh, in uh, the NYSA and the NSA today, it's pretty amazing. Here's uh, Dave Tinder, one of the collectors from Michigan, early collectors, collections now, institutional collection in, in Michigan. Here's the panel clip for people to view. Is that him barking? Wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> Street side. <laughs> That's great. Alan Weiner and Roberta Etter. These were two uh, of the early dealers that had the mail order catalogs. Uh, Alan is still active in uh, Manhattan. Roberta's in, in Spain right now and uh, not quite as active, but Alan still buys and sells on eBay and has been uh, uh, sort of a, a mainstay of people's collections for stereo and vintage photographic equipment. And, so we, gotta uh, get Al, we gotta get Alan in when we start to do the meetings again. I'll see if I, I, I've invited him to join a couple of times, haven't gotten him in. He's not as te technically savvy, but uh, see if we can do to get him going. Yeah, you know, we could get him down to a real meeting now. At least we can get, we'll Uber him in or something. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, it'd be wonderful to get him uh, engaged. He's got some great stories. <laughs> yeah. A little bit later, NSA convention, 1984. Um, number of uh, individuals that you may recommend here, or recommend, recognize here. We've got- uh, The beauty of this uh, shot is it looks like it's double the size, right? <laughs> you better get yeah. out to the anagliff. <laughs> Yeah, you can see the you know the Pinskys and uh, you know, a variety of uh, folks that are hidden yeah. within the uh, organization here. This is uh, moving forward to the Manchester Convention in '84, one that I was actually able to make, which was a spectacular convention and uh, had a great time. Uh, I believe this is the auction. He's uh, the auctioneer during that time with some of the auction items on the table in the back. Here's the panel clip to take a look at. And where was this? What where, where was this? Manchester, New Hampshire. New Hampshire, got it. Yeah. First time I'd ever been to New Hampshire from Arizona. Now, picking locations for the conventions, what is that done with like a, a dartboard or something? <laughs> it, it was done by a combination. The board uh, selects a combination of having local people to help put it together, having a, sort of a nexus of collectors and a nexus of activities for the people that are creating and uh, making stereo images. So trying to find a balance between them. Um, also trying to balance the cost of locations. So uh, many of them were East Coast. There was a very heavy nexus of uh, of Ohio, Michigan, you know, um, Midwestern and Eastern uh, collection connections. A couple have been in, in the LA area. A couple have been up in the New England area, like Tacoma, which were in the uh, Northwest. Tacoma's coming up. We've had a Seattle uh, symposium in the past. They're just amazing to be able to go and see the stereo theater, the sharing of information, room hopping, finding out uh, more information about pretty much whatever you want to from some of the top experts and seeing great material at the uh, at the trade shows. So. Highly encourage anybody to uh, that can possibly make one to to do so. Here's the uh, analog version for you. Another view. This is '88. Uh, Willie Schaefer, one of the major photographic dealers right now, with his stereo views, daguerreotypes, and so on. Uh, very typical trade show look on all of these. These sort of open hotel oh, yeah, room yeah. with uh, everybody packed in place. Yeah, switch over to the analog. I guess there's an analog. Oh, there yep. you go. Now, where would this have been? Uh, I don't remember off the top 88. I should have this off the top of my head, but I no, don't. No, I, 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 it's not, it was just a. Will, I was Willie just was just, I was at virtually every one of these with Willie. So they all sort of blend together. And uh, it's very difficult to tell the rooms unless they're in color. You know, maybe the, the gold versus the, uh, the beige <laughs> for the background of the, uh, the hotel <laughs> yeah. uh, conference room is about the only thing you can use to tell the difference. Got it, got it. Here's Brent Rolls, who's a photographer for many of these uh, as a judge. These are the stereo competitions where people have both vintage and contemporary views and uh, they're judged for, for the competition. And uh, then the winners appear in stereo world following the conventions. This one's Cincinnati 88. So I believe the previous one was 88. So also Cincinnati. Now who thought yeah, of- good for oh, you. Okay, now who thought of doing it that way? Or putting a, is that like a the, the way he's- the display. The, the, way, the, the way they're displayed comes from the, uh, uh, again, postal history, from the way that people would do at the uh, stamp shows, the sort of stamp uh, 
I can't remember what they're called, the frames. They use those for ephemera, for stamp shows, and a variety of others. It's a quick and easy way for people to send material, to display it, and then pack it, send it back again. So the frames are owned by the organization. Images are sent by the individuals, and then they're put with uh, captions and title and put together for display. And it's fairly easy to have a viewer and work your way sort of up and down the, the, uh, uh, the frames to be able to see the images. They also uh, act as a tent, so you can put them side by side and have one on one side of the table, one on the other side of the table to make it easier for people to, to view and display. Often they're in a separate room. This time they happen to be in the same room with the trade show. Here's uh, Almond Vern Conover, another early uh, collectors at Cincinnati in 88. 88. by Brent Rolls. Another Gordon Hoffman, one of the major collectors that uh, put together a uh, amazing collection and has uh, had impact on uh, both private institutional collections all over the country with the material he collected. Do you know anything about his background? I don't off the top. I should have all of the people's uh, uh, bios on the back of my head. I know them. I know them all, but it's just uh, prepping for this and everything else. I've uh, looking more at the, the overview rather than the detail on the individuals. Okay. Sorry. No, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'll have that for the next one. I would like, yeah, I'm just curious because it's a fascinating nexus that they kind of all kind of drew in. I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah, please go right yep. ahead. No problem. We're doing bios of a lot of the individuals and putting those together for Stereo World and other publications. So we'll be putting more detail to follow and sort of honor them. John Craig is one I'm working on right now. So uh, I did one on uh, Ray Phillips who collected in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and, uh, you know, trying to find some way to document the, the stories behind these guys before the stories disappear, before we all disappear that know those stories. Hey, well, well, the there a, the, uh, was that a building or a boat? Was it like a radar on top of it? I'm not sure. It's a convention center, so I'm assuming it's probably an early... Uh, uh, it says some Wayfair. Sort of early... It's kind of... Uh, nah, I guess. It, looks yeah. like a, it looks like radar this, to me, but that's okay. This, this would be 88, so it's probably some early uh, communication device that they're doing out in the Thule's. And a couple of uh, collectors, many of uh, the folks who are on this call may know, Bob Duncan and Dave Wheeler. Uh, Bob Duncan has been doing the auctions for many years, and Dave Wheeler put together an amazing collection. He passed away, and his collection is now uh, sold at auction in New York and is uh, in many private and public collections. Now, have you, yeah. Uh, how did you get these? Are these your private pictures? Or how did, where these yeah, these are, all, these are all mine. Oh, excellent. These were... Uh, some that I took and other people took. I'm not sure these are sort of blended together, but Carl Moss at a later uh, symposium, one of the uh, trade shows, again, the analog version. Carl's one of the publishers. He's done the biography of Western photographers, several books of mine, number of books on stereo photography and historic photography. He's a publisher, collector, researcher, and, uh, lawyer out of uh, Los Angeles. This is uh, Jeff Krauss, Michael McEachern, and uh, Brian Jins. Brian in the back is a uh, photo dealer um, dealing in stereo cameras, stereo photography viewers. Michael is a uh, researcher in uh, geog geology and does a lot of work using the stereo views as a uh, uh, resource for that. And uh, Jeff Krause in the foreground is one of the preeminent uh, stereo dealers right now with uh, amazing amounts of uh, material available in stereo and photographic history. There's the analogs for you. So anyway, after a all the cycle here, we've got 48 years, we're getting close to 50 years for the organization and trying to say, what happens next? How do you capture what's happened in that 48 year history? How do you uh, provide a legacy? How do you protect some of the things that have happened, share them, uh, make them available? So that's sort of the next half of what the presentation is about the next portion of the presentation. The mission, just to recap it, uh, promoting research collection and use of vintage and contemporary stereo views, cameras and equipment, uh, promoting the practice of stereo photography and encouraging the use of stereoscopy for visual arts and technology and fostering appreciation of stereograph and the visual historic record. That's sort of a general mission to, that uh, the NSA has with trying to promote for those 48 years. When did the, just a quick, quick question, when did the, the historical value of them, and not just the value of the print, but the actual image itself, like looking at the, when did that become a part of like a historical value? Is when, you, know. you, you started seeing a little bit of that in the 1960s with a publisher like Bonanza Press and the others that were using them. They typically would show one half of the view, not the full stereo view, and use those as illustrations in historic books. 1970s, again, was a sort of blossoming with uh, the bicentennial in 76 and the blossoming of interest in 
historic photography and history in general, finding stereo views as a way to get information about that time period. So that's when I see the, the real um, resurgence of interest and the expansion. You look at um, the documentary photography using stereo, the, the uh, interest in history, you know, roots, and the um, uh, the various uh, PBS documentaries that have been put together using historic photography, all of that seemed to start germinate in the 1970s and blossom in the 80s and 90s as it worked its way through. Uh, NSA and many of the people in the NSA have participated in those, providing images, uh, providing uh, you know consulting uh, information for, for a variety of the publications and presentations that have been made. The NSA also has a strategic planning group that we put together in the early aughts, or end of the aughts, near the early teens. And a couple of things popped up in that strategic planning direction. One is trying to find ways that we can generate interest in stereo photography and collecting to attract new members. Uh, everyone's aware of all the collecting organizations having a, a uh, uh, the issue of the challenge of new membership and the membership dropping from several thousand to a thousand to sub a thousand for the NSA but uh, fairly stable and fairly strong still, but how do you keep that going and how do you engage new people and young people to uh, become part of this? Uh, another issue is documenting and stabilizing the history of the NSA. How do we figure, how, how do we find a way to leave a trail and to package the checklists and the, NS, the um, publications that we've done, uh, views that have been made, any, any of the material that has been generated by our collecting organization and our members, preserving the publication, the content, and the business records, and then promoting the research, collection, and use of stereo resources as the sort of theme that we're trying to do. How do we keep that going and um, provide a legacy in the future? One of the things that the NSA tried was the Oliver Wendell Holmes Library. It was established very soon after the organization formed, uh, August 1979, with the Canton Art Institute. They uh, accepted donations from our members and uh, eventually grew to a collection of about 20,000 stereo views with hundreds of reference books and other materials. It was available as part of the Canton Art Institute. Then it moved to Eastern College, briefly to Gettysburg College. Um, one of the issues was volume, cost, and access. The volume of the material, trying to find staffing and support for it, making it accessible so that people could uh, come in and use the material it became a, a real challenge and the organization was not able to support the cost that the institutions would have for either rental or personnel or other costs. So we sort of it migrated and moved from place to place. Uh, eventually a private host, a Wolfgang and Marianne Sell had an auto parts dealership with an extra space and they absorbed the collection and pr provided a home for it and support for it for a number of years. But eventually that uh, just did not work and it was not able to find a, another home. A very difficult decision and somewhat controversial decision at the time was made to um, liquidate the Oliver Wendell Holmes collection and uh, reinvest the money back into the organization. It was sold in 2006. Some material was placed at other institutions and the proceeds were placed in an endowment at the time to uh, support that historic side of the organization. We had an opportunity to um, that popped up at the in the late teens, uh, Paula Fleming, I, and others have been helping Library of Congress with some of the cataloging and organizing their stereo collection. And we had a, initial meetings with uh, Helen, Helena Zinkham and uh, Micah Messenheimer, who were the director and the curator of photography, the prints and photographs area at the Library of Congress during that time, and started talking with them about their collection. They have a huge collection of stereo views. And uh, it, I'll show you a picture of it in a few moments, but it's available to the public. You can go into the prints and photographs room and open the drawers and look at the material. You can take them to the tables. You can photograph them. You can't remove them from the sleeves, but you can photograph them. They have many of them. I'll give you a number in a few moments, um, digitized and available online for you to use, but it's a, it's a tremendous resource. And uh, some of it comes from copyright placement from images that were sent to the Library of Congress or copyright. Some have been donated, some have come from acquisition, and it's it's a just a staggering collection uh, of international material. Some of it's cataloged by location, some of it's cataloged by topic. But um, we started talking with them, and we just, it, the timing was right. 
and we were able to get them excited and interested in doing something in the way of a collaboration. So we met with the board, several board members around this call. Thank you to your all the board members that are here for their support in trying to make this work. But we put together um, a proposal to say, let's talk with the Library of Congress about trying to put together a relationship, see where we can go. Began negotiations in 2019. Three components bubbled up. One was uh, taking their collection and branding it calling it the National Stereoscopic Research Collection as a collaboration between the NSA and the Library of Congress to help increase the visibility of the collection, make people aware of stereo, and to um, you know, try and, and generate some more uh, interest and support for the organization and for the collection and for stereo. The other was a research fellowship, uh, taking the collection and having people who would work specifically on the collection to try and publish information about that to do articles, to do publications, and so on. And then uh, the annual stereoscopic lecture, they were excited enough that they were able to put through a lecture. So each year, the Library of Congress will have one of their annual lectures that's dedicated to stereoscopic photography using the collection in conjunction with the NSA. This is one half of the collections. These are the file cabinets that are completely filled with stereo views. That's the stereo collection. Uh, it's two sides. So this is a picture of one side of it. Uh, roughly 52,000 images here, and they've got another probably close to 35 or 40,000 images that are in processing in the back that uh, are being worked on. Uh, again, they're cataloged by location, by topic. Um, it's it's an astounding collection. If you have a chance to get to DC, it's well worth going to. And if you don't, it's well worth spending time on the digital collection to be able to graze and, and look at things and see what's happening there. Hey, you worked we so hard on it that they actually made a... They... There's a whole column there that get dedicated to you. Look, it's the row column. Yep. Yes, and they they have a typo just like my presentation misspelled my name. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> um, we we finally were able to get this uh, agreement through the Library of Congress attorneys, uh, through everybody at, at that end, through our board, and uh, with the support of the board, we were able to sign the initial agreement in 2021 in November uh, for the uh, establishing the collection, and then the fellowship agreement followed that. Fellowship agreement, we were able to sign uh, a three year agreement in December 2021. Public announcement was held for a period of time. We just opened the door with that on February 3rd, which is what John was aware of and why he asked me to talk at this, um, this session to give you a little bit of a background. And we were able to time that with the stereo world. It just came out, mine came on Friday, which has the uh, uh, notice. I'll show you that in just a moment. And the first fellowship is in process right now. The call for the fellowships is live. and uh, we're looking for those by April 15th. There's a joint National Stereoscopic Association board and uh, Library of Congress uh, selection process that will select the first fellows. Fellows are going to be announced at the uh, Tacoma NSA in August, and then they'll be doing the research in 2023 and doing presentations and publications afterwards. Then we'll have a rolling cycle. With, uh, we've got three years of funding right now to be able to work at this level. Initial donations that we've been able to give to the Library of Congress, a uh, complete run of Stereo World. They had partial runs, and now they've got complete runs in the reading room for people to come. And uh, we may have a couple of gaps for duplicate copies, which we'll do some calls for to see if we can get them filled out completely. We're giving them copies of our checklists and reference materials that Tex Treadwell and others have been done uh, in the past, including the work that uh, Paula Fleming and, and uh, Rusty Norton and I and others have been doing for the, uh, the web version. And then there are seven boxes, you can see the photos in the bottom of manuscript and reference materials from William C. Dara that had been in a storage locker for the NSA in uh, Atlanta for a number of years. We were able to pull those out, get those cataloged, and those are in process of going through the Library of Congress cataloging at this point. So that's uh, sort of the big, big picture, the big story, a little bit of an overview. Here's the cover of the new Stereo World. If you haven't gotten it, it's in the mail and should be in your hands very shortly. And there's a one pager with uh, the links and the information about where to go for more information about the collaboration. And if you're interested in applying for the fellowship um, uh, to get information for that. And here's my contact information. If you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through John and the NYSA and others if you need it. And that's pretty much what I've got for the good of the cause.